Every year when we celebrate the solemnity of the Epiphany as we are celebrating it today, we of course sing the traditional Epiphany songs, especially the We Three Kings song. And when we sing the We Three Kings songs, I'm reminded of a story from about 1994, the good old days when you could tell the Christmas story in public schools. When my siblings were in high school, that was about that time, my older siblings were in high school, they were putting on the Christmas play at Grinnell. And of course, our family would attend, as we were required to do, to watch our siblings and these sorts of things. And as they were telling the Christmas story and singing the traditional Christmas hymns, they were singing Silent Night, Away in a Manger, and it came time for the Three Kings to make their appearance. And of course, they sang the We Three Kings song. However, they changed the words. And one of the kings happened to be whom you know now as Father Tony Stevens. And he had kind of the lead part in this. As he came in, they were saying, We three kings of Orient are thirsty. And ever, and ever since then, every year, that's all I think of when we sing that song. And our family, our family would do it for years afterwards, singing the same thing. We always thought it was hilarious. I don't know if it's hilarious, but we always laughed. And so now you know what I always think about on Epiphany has nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> the word epiphany itself means manifestation. When we talk about epiphany, the church talks about epiphany actually in three different events that, that are associated with the epiphany. This event that we celebrate today is the first part of that epiphany when the three magi come and give honor and reverence and homage to Christ as king. The second event that is associated with Epiphany then is Jesus' baptism, which is actually celebrated tomorrow this year and because of the way that Christmas falls. Normally, baptism is celebrated on a Sunday, and we celebrate it as a, as a solemnity in, on, on that Sunday, but it's celebrated as a solemnity tomorrow. And finally, the third way in which Epiphany is celebrated and recognized is at the miracle at the wedding feast of Cana. So it's these three events that make up the epiphany, which is a manifestation. So if it is a manifestation, then we ought to ask the question, what is being manifested in each of these events? We can actually go back to Pope Benedict XVI in, a, in, one, of, in one of his first homilies. Actually, is, is his first Christmas as Pope in 2005, his uh, epiphany of 2005. And he spoke about what each of these manifestations meant for us. And we can find it in the fathers of the church as they spoke about this as well. But the manifestation that takes place when the Magi come and give honor and reverence and homage to our Lord is a manifestation of that Jesus' mission is not just to the Israelites and that salvation is not just for the Jews and the Israelites, but it's for all people. Because the Magi were not Jews, they were not Israelites, they were Gentiles from a foreign nation. And what's beautiful about their, them being foreigners is that they come from far away, and not only that, but they're looking at the signs in the world, the signs in the skies. So they are, in a sense, scientists of that period, scientists that are, or astronomers that are looking at the, at the stars and noticing that something is different. But because they were magi, they were men of wisdom, seeking wisdom in, of all sorts, and so they knew the prophecies of the different religions, knowing the prophecies of Israel as well. Probably knowing even Numbers 24. Numbers 24 says that a star will rise from the east. And so knowing this prophecy, they were probably looking for a star. Knowing that a king will rise in, in Jerusalem, or that a king will arise in Bethlehem, they looked for the signs, and they saw the signs, and they began to follow them. And the signs led them to God, looking at the things of the world, the material creation that God has given, pointing to God himself. The second manifestation of Jesus at the baptism, when we think of the story of the baptism and we think about Jesus going down into the water and being plunged into the water by John the Baptist, what is being revealed and manifested there, because when Jesus comes out of the water, the Holy Spirit comes down in the form of a dove, and the voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 
And Pope Benedict says that God's, uh, God's only begotten Son is manifested at the baptism, telling us that Jesus is God that we, and that we are to listen to him, as God says in, the, in that moment. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, makes his appearance. The presence of the whole Trinity is present in that moment of Christ's baptism. God the Father and the voice. God the Holy Spirit and the dove and Christ himself, the second person of the Trinity. The revelation of the Trinity happening at that moment. And thirdly, the manifestation of Christ at the wedding feast of Cana is to manifest his glory and to manifest himself to the disciples. Remember, he has already chosen his disciples, and, he and Mary and Jesus and the disciples are invited to this wedding in Cana, and the couple runs out of wine. And it would be an embarrassment for a newly married couple for them to run out of wine. Some scholars, in a joking manner, say they ran out of wine because Jesus invited 12 people who weren't originally invited. And so, of course, they ran out of wine. But Mary intercedes on behalf of the couple, and Jesus performs his first miracle to show his glory and to show himself to the apostles and to begin his ministry, to begin his mission in the world, to begin his mission of our salvation. When we go back to the three kings and we look at the three gifts that the king or the magi give to Christ. There's also a manifestation in each of these gifts that we can understand in a deeper way as well. The gold symbolizes the kingship of Jesus, that he will be a great king. And when we look at the greatest king of all of Israel in Solomon, Solomon was, in a sense, greater than even David. Solomon built the temple. Solomon actually brought peace to Jerusalem, even though Solomon eventually fell. But the kings from other nations came to give reverence and honor to Solomon as well. And they brought gold. And they brought all of these gifts. Gold is a sign of kingship. The frankincense in that gift is a sign of Jesus' divinity. Frankincense and the incense that we use at Mass is a sign of who our God is. And it's a sign when we burn it as a sign of our prayers going up to heaven, going up to God. And finally, the myrrh is the gift that is given. The myrrh is a sign of the death that Christ will experience, that he will die on the cross in order to win our salvation. And so these gifts that are given to him are not just gifts and very expensive gifts that are given to them, maybe even gifts that helped the Holy Family when they had to flee for their lives. They had to flee for their lives and run away from Herod and the death that he desired to incur upon Jesus. Maybe those were the gifts that sustained them during those times. But that myrrh, the gold, and the frankincense, all were the signs of who Jesus was. What I love about today's, all of these things I really love about, about this feast. But I think one of the most important things about this feast that is important for us is the way in which the, the Magi respond. I think it's important for us to look at the Magi and see them as examples for us. The Magi who are looking for signs of the divinity, looking for signs of the king who is going to come into their lives. And so they were looking at the natural events of the world, looking at the signs in the skies in a sense. And looking at all of these things that God has created and through these things God leads them to himself. I think there's moments in our life when we might be struggling to find God, when we might be struggling to see God's presence in the world, struggling to see God's manifestation in the world. And we forget to look at the natural things of the world because we know that God created them. And because God creates them, they always point back to him. One of my favorite things is going down to my grandma and grandpa's old farm where my brother Kevin lives now. And there was a time when the, there, there were no lights down there. And you go down there, and they live kind of down in, in the creek bottom, and so the hills around it block out all of the lights from the neighboring farms, and they block out all the lights from all the towns from far away. And the only light that was down there was the light from the stars. It's an incredible sight to go into a place where the only light that you have is light from the stars. 
And it makes your mind think of what is beyond me? What is beyond this world? That all of those lights, all of those stars are there. These natural things, these natural points of beauty point to our creator. And that's what the Magi found in our gospel today. But the way in which they respond when they actually go and meet Christ, they follow all of these natural events to find the Savior, to find God, to find Christ. But the way in which they leave is important for us as well. The scripture, said, the scripture today says, And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their country by another way. And we can take that to mean literally that they chose a different route not to go back through Herod, not to go and report to Herod what they found as Herod asked. And that is true. That is what they did. They didn't go back to Herod. They went back to their home countries, not through Jerusalem. But the fathers of the church speak about this in a spiritual sense as well. And in a spiritual sense is that every time that we encounter Christ, we cannot go back the same. We must be transformed by that encounter with Christ. That's what happened to the Magi in the gospel today. They encountered Christ and thus they were transformed by their encounter with him such that they were changed and went back a different person, went back a different way. Every time that we come to Mass, it is meant to be an encounter with Christ. It's an encounter with the living God. So it's such that when we encounter the living God through the Mass, we cannot go back the same way. When we have an encounter with God at any moment of our life, because there's ways in which we encounter God even outside of Mass, because God has created all things. And so we have encounters with Christ even in our daily lives. We are changed by those encounters with Christ. Such that when we come to Mass, we bring Everything with us when we come to Mass, we bring all of our sufferings, all of our joys, we bring all of our problems, all of our distractions, we bring all of our doubts, all of our insecurities, we bring our anxieties, we bring everything with us when we come to Mass. And when we come to Mass, we ought to have this mentality that we want to offer it all to God. The Mass is first and foremost a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of our God who gives himself to us, but it's meant to be us laying our lives down in sacrifice for him as well. And so in order for it to be a sacrifice, we have to bring something to sacrifice, and that is our very selves, and that is all of who we are. Not just the good parts of us, but even the parts that we really don't want other people to know, and we really don't want God to know either. That's the irony of us being human, is that we try and hide from God. We see it all the way back in the garden when Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they tried to hide from God. Of course, we cannot hide from God. But we want to bring all of that and we want to lay it on the altar. The spirituality of the Mass is such that when the priest lifts up the bread and says, Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, we want to imagine ourselves placing all of who we are on that paten when the priest lifts that paten up with the bread in it. And we want to be able to say, Lord, I give myself totally to you. When he lifts that chalice up and says, Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, we want to imagine ourselves placing all of who we are into that chalice. And as that bread and wine and the words of consecration are prayed over it and it is transubstantiated into the body and blood of Christ, we pray that we are transformed and that we are changed to be like Christ as we are meant to be. So that when we encounter Christ in this Mass, that we are transformed, that we are changed. Changed to be like Christ as he intends for us to be. Epiphany is not just something that happened to Christ, but Epiphany is that manifestation of Christ in our lives every day. And when we leave this Mass, we want to make a resolution. This is why it's good for us to stay after Mass and make a prayer of thanksgiving to God for what He has done for us and who He is. And in that moment of thanksgiving, we want to make a resolution to say, this week I will recognize Christ in my daily life, or I will work on this bad habit in my life, or I will work on this, or whatever it is. We will make a resolution to do better this week 
in whatever we are working on. The saints constantly remind us that if we are not making progress in the spiritual life, if we are not going forward, we are going backward. There is no middle ground in the spiritual life. It's either forward or backward. If we are not leaving Mass, recognizing that we've had this encounter with Christ and making ourselves better, through the grace of God, of course, then we are actually going backwards. We are wasting the grace that God is giving us and wasting those encounters with Christ. We must go back a different way. And in every sacrament that we receive, it's an encounter with the living God. That's what all of the sacraments, all of the liturgies are. It's the making Christ present through the ministry of the priest so we may know him, that we may live in him and be transformed to be like him as he intends for us to be.